Uh, no, that's not to slight archaeology. It's a matter of taste. Uh, there are many historians who might consider this, themselves also archaeologists, many archaeologists who might consider themselves also historians, but it's not my thing. I like the written word. I like to think about ideas. And we are not yet in the world of humans being able to articulate their ideas at least not very well. So let's jump into it. It's going to be a little shorter than normal, but I think it's going to be fun. So here we are. So where do we start our story? We start our story in 1974, 474 years after this class is supposed to have ended. We start our story with the discovery of a human body, human remains, in one of, one of, but not the most remote places that humans were able to go. That place is Australia. So, Mungo Man, discovered in 1974 by J.M. Bowler at the Australian National University. It's a burial site. We're in a world, this module, and perhaps the next, where burial sites are going to be incredibly important to our story. Burial sites can tell us a lot about what early humans valued, how they treated those around them. It gives us some indication that, okay, there's some idea of an afterlife. There's some idea of a way that uh, human remains should be handled. There's something here that is considered to be good or can some way of behaving that is considered to be proper. And so for that reason, they are interesting. Now, Mungo Man is not the oldest human remains at this site. Uh, Mungo Man was discovered quite near an already existing site, Mungo Woman. Now, Mungo Woman, interesting in their own right. So, Mungo Woman is a cremated remains. That indicates, you know, a certain level of care, a certain level of uh, belief on how the body should be prepared for death, but does not give us much of a skeleton to study if everything has already been burned. The site of Mungo Man dates to about 40,000 BCE. This would have been 10,000 years after humans had first made it to Australia. So right away we've got two key dates. Mungo Man site, 40,000 BCE, before the Common Era, and humans making it to Australia for the first time, 50,000 BCE, before the Common Era. Incidentally, this is about the same time, 50,000 BCE, that humans first make it into Europe. It's a colder climate, it's harder to get there, it's harder to survive and things like that. So, once we begin in Africa, and again, many times I'm going to repeat, humans are from Africa today, but hopefully you're coming into this class with at least that little bit of knowledge already in your heads. Uh, once we make it out of Africa, the direction is sort of West Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, onto what becomes Southeast and East Asia, China, and things like that then only slowly down to Australia, slowly across to the Americas, and slowly up into Europe. That journey would have begun, that journey first out of Africa and into Asia, sometime between 80,000 and 60,000 BCE. Let's look at a map of what that would have been. So if you look here, if you'll excuse my cursor, we have here a map of the world around uh, about this time, around about 40,000 BCE. And if you look at the map, you'll notice that the oceans are not quite as close to some parts of the land as they are now. Japan here is not an island. The coast of Africa stretches out more. Uh, this bit of water here, the Strait of Malacca and what have you, this is this is now exposed land. So if someone if we were to ask how did humans make at least most of the trip to Australia, the answer is more than is possible today, they walked. Now some of that trip was also boat. And a theme this semester, one that's going to get repeated a lot, is we don't actually know when and where the first boats were invented because they were made out of materials that are now gone. Uh, Boats would have been involved, but it would have been a lot more walking than a modern map of modern oceans would imply. If we keep moving, we get to the site of the earliest known humans. So, I don't want to spend a lot of time this semester talking about evolution. You know what evolution is, I hope. 
but we can talk about what are the sort of immediate predecessors to humans. We can note the fact that Homo sapiens sapiens, us, were not the only option on the table. There were, in fact, Homo sapiens sapiens were living in a world of many different kinds of what's called hominins. Now, a hominin refers to all humans and their genetic ancestors, but does not refer to anyone that would not have become a human. So there's more Homo sapiens than there are Homo sapiens sapiens, more types of Homo sapiens. But a hominin, this word, does not include chimpanzee, it does not include gorilla, it does not include orangutan, nothing that would not have evolved into a human being. For the most part, what sets hominins apart from other species, the main thing that makes us human really is not uh, how we look, not what we eat, not necessarily our genetic makeup as such, but our ability to use tools to manipulate our environment and to use tools to create new tools, to think through problems and to create solutions, manufacture ways of uh, solving those problems from the world around us. Now, the earliest Homo sapiens sapiens, the earliest genetic or biological, I'll say, remains of any Homo sapiens sapiens, or perhaps so early that they're the step just before Homo sapiens sapiens, the earliest possible humans, as we know humans in 2023, the earliest skulls that we have are from a site in Ethiopia discovered in 1997 called Herto. So these are either the earliest humans or their immediate predecessor. It demonstrates, again, what I hope is obvious to all of us, that all humans come out of Africa. But it also tells us a little bit about how early humans live. They would have used stone tools to scrape the flesh off of, we know from this site, hippopotamuses, and things like that. We know also from the site the only skull found there that is a child skull is of particular interest. It is covered in scratch marks and other kinds of things like that from the use of stone tools. What does this mean? Well, it could mean one of two things, say archaeologists, of which I am not one. It could have been part of ritual preparation for the dead, they could have been preparing the child's skull for the afterlife, or it could have been, perhaps less savory, cannibalism. It could have been that the child, maybe there's something special about child skull meats. Maybe they're the sweetest meats and we just don't know it. That knowledge is lost to humans now, but once, once was known, they could have simply been eating it, could have been dire times and they ate it, we do not know. But either way, we've got our stone tools, We've got humans, or the closest thing to humans before humans happen. The closest thing to Homo sapiens sapiens before Homo sapiens sapiens happen. And we have, for whatever reason, some elaborate structure surrounding the death and passing on of Homo sapiens sapiens. It's not, however, just archaeological evidence, or rather just the the finding location of human remains that lets us know uh, definitively that humans do in fact come out of Africa. We can also do this through DNA tracking and testing. So most uh, dioxyribonucleic acid, a bit of a mouthful, most DNA acid in a child is a recombination and mixture of the male and the female parents. Some DNA, however, MT, DNA, mitochondrial DNA, passes directly from mother to child. Now, it passes directly from mother to both children, but if we think about that for a second, if we want to draw a straight line of mitochondrial DNA passed on and passed on and passed on and passed on, that means we need a straight line of women who give birth to women who give birth to women who give birth to women. And so to identify that line, an unbroken line of mitochondrial DNA, one has been found. And it points to locations in West Africa, near what is now Tanzania, uh, what researchers call a mitochondrial Eve. The first woman, not the first human or homo sapiens sapien woman to ever exist, 
but the first woman whose daughters had daughters had daughters had daughters and so on and so forth. Uh, she would have lived in an incredibly different world. The total population of anatomically modern humans that would have been walking the earth at the time of mitochondrial Eve would have been between 10 and 20,000 people. It would have been a fairly depopulated place. And that would have been a population that remained stable until the development of agriculture. We are in the time of mitochondrial Eve, in the time of Mungo man and Mungo woman, in the time of this hertocyte. You know, we're talking about humans who are living through hunting and living off what they can find. There is, uh, one would assume, a fair bit of knowledge about their world, and as we get to paintings and artistic works from these people, reflection thereupon, but uh, there's not a lot of higher level manipulation. There's not a lot of agriculture and things like that. Not a lot of um, intentionally herding and breeding animals. Instead, what you're doing is chasing them around. So that number, that 20, 10 to 20,000 people, that is a figure that comes mostly from what their environment in West Africa could sustain without any further development of agriculture or something like that. Let's pause then briefly and think, well, what is it that makes human behavior unique from other types of similar animals? Uh, I would argue, as does your book, the ability to plan ahead, the ability to modify tools to improve them, uh, the capacity to develop trade networks, uh, the making of art as a reflection upon one's world and the struggles therein, uh, burial rituals, and importantly, speech. So speech, of course, leaves behind no clear record. As we get later in the semester, we'll talk about the problems of oral histories. Exciting though they are, they represent some challenges. But in the very earliest days of humanity, it's really difficult to guess when exactly did humans begin speaking. And in fact, we only can guess. We can only guess when speech began off the existence of organized social activities that would have required some form of communication. They would have had to require some form of, hey, you go there, and I'll go here, you do this, and I'll do that. Some kind of well-thought-out planning. And the most obvious social activity in the days of early humanity that would have required this level of planning is going to be hunting. Now, for that reason, because it is hunting, and because archaeologists know that it is primarily, although not exclusively, men in these societies who hunted, it is thought that speech would have begun with male Homo sapiens sapiens before being picked up by female Homo sapiens sapiens. In sites in South Africa, for example, animal remains show the use of spears and arrows, manufacturing these, uh, training offspring, how to manufacture these, making sure that one generation can teach another, and things like that. These are going to be acts that require speech. At Pinnacle Point in Cape Town in South Africa, small blades that humans had attached to wooden shafts were discovered, indicating a high level of thinking and planning. And these would have been use, in use excuse me, for about 11,000 years. Now, if they stay again, this is not the most satisfying, but this is kind of how you have to think about it. If these uh, stone tools, these small blades attached to wooden shafts, are being made and passed down for 11,000 years without any significant change, and yet you or I are born without the inert knowledge of how to build one, the way, say, a bird is born with the inert knowledge of how to inert, <laughs> innate, innate knowledge of how to build one, uh, say a nest, a bird can, you know, just knows on instinct how to build a nest. I'm human. I don't know how to build this knife that was made for 11,000 years. I could guess sort of, but it's probably not going to be a very good knife. <clears throat> that means therefore speech. That means passing down. That means higher cognitive ability. We then move on to artistic reproduction. And if you want to talk about artistic reproduction, it's the Blombos site that is the oldest evidence of artistic work known in the human 
record indicating not just planning for the future, one day we will hunt, you must know how to make this knife, I must know how to make this knife, but a deep and very serious reflection on the world around one's self. So, Blombos, what is it? It's about 186 miles east of Cape Town. It is a cave where humans would have formerly dwelled. Dates to about 100,000 BCE, so quite a long time ago. People living there would have fished, they would have hunted, they would have made fine bone tools, that sort of thing. And they also would have mixed soil minerals with animal fat to make paint. Now, why would they have made paint? Well, if we look at this picture here, we see the two earliest known containers ever created for human use to house exactly this paint. Your guess on what it is used to decorate, however, is as good as mine or anyone else's. It could have been used to decorate the body, could have been used to decorate dwellings, clothing, the walls of a cave, could have been used for anything. Now, Blombos here, and when, when I say it may have been used to uh, decorate the body, this is some evidence that it would have been. Blombos, this site, also contains an enormous amount of shells. And these shells all have holes drilled into them so that the, uh, you know, they can be strung together, indicating that whoever would have had them probably wore them. Wore them as a necklace, wore them as some kind of belt, something like that. Their colors show that they were either painted themselves, someone painted the shells, or they were worn against human skin that had been painted. So they have this kind of ochre color, that red that you see there, O-C-H-E-R. Either the shells are painted or the skin is painted, but these things are for human decoration, and they are used to sort of make humans, you know, appear, at least what is to them, uh, more attractive than they would naturally without these shells. And they're not, they're not a minor thing. They're not, you know, humans writ large in this world are interested in altering their appearance through painting themselves or wearing painted objects and that kind of thing. These shells appear in what is now Algeria and Israel up to 80,000 years ago. Again, this indicates a couple of things. What's going on at Blombos, this need to decorate the body, this is happening across Africa and what will become Western Asia, the Middle East, things like that. And that this world is a deeply connected world. From South Africa to what becomes Algeria, we have these shells. They're not walking themselves there. Now, I'm not indicating that one person walks the whole length of Africa either, but I am saying that this is a pretty extensive trade network through which these objects can move. So we're learning, if you're noticing, we're learning quite quickly a few core things about humanity. One, uh, early humans care for the dead, early humans capacity to plan, early humans uh, ability to think on a higher level, early humans an, uh, an interest in adorning themselves, changing their appearance, and through the manufacture of paint and things like that, changing the appearance of the world around them. The last thing I would point out, and here I've moved a slide early, the last thing I would point out is that the, if humans here are making paint, if they're making shells, if they're trading like this, we have a world where humans have moved far beyond the everyday struggle of just meeting their needs and surviving. This is not a world I'd want to move back to. It is a world of considerable hardship, but not maybe as much hardship as we would want to think. There is the existence of these shells and of artwork also indicates an enormous amount of free time held by these people. But let's move on. Let's get out of Africa and onto new and more exciting places. Long distance migration in this world required the ability to plan longer into the future and probably also required speech to organize those who were traveling, building boats, things like that. Humans moved into Asia between 80 and 60,000 years ago, as I said earlier in the lecture. 
and then on to Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and eventually Australia about 50,000 years ago. They arrive in Europe around the same time, about 50,000 years ago, and find there a climate that was incredibly cold compared to what they were used to coming out of Africa. And you might then imagine that that cold climate presents a serious uh, obstacle for human migration. Moving north becomes very difficult. One has to learn how new skills, building different kinds of dwellings, finding new places to sleep, uh, new plants, what can you eat, that sort of thing, what's growing in the cold, uh, making clothing to keep yourself warm, this sort of thing slows down human migration into Europe. Once they get into Europe, however, and somewhat interestingly, they find that, oh no, we're not alone. Uh, the humans that leave Africa up into Europe that we're discussing now, once they get there, they find that Neanderthals are already there. Humans displaced Neanderthals in Europe about 40,000 years ago. And finally, talking about this whirlwind migration, the Americas become the last place, last major place, humans reach, reaching it only in 14,000 BCE. They're on the move. Uh, humans crossed from Africa into Asia along coastline. They would have gone along uh, land bridges to the Arabian Peninsula out of Africa. And the oldest evidence of human migration to Asia comes from a place in South Asia in India. And you're going to have to excuse all my pronunciation this semester that is not English, Chinese, or Thai. Those are the only languages I have. Brace for me to butcher everything else. But uh, Jwalapuram in India is a site where there are no human remains, but there are tools from 74,000 BCE indicating the presence of humans. These are stone tools and deposits of ochre paints, red like we saw just a few slides ago, that suggest a link to travelers' origins in Africa. So they're using the same tools that were in Africa, they're using the same paints that were in Africa. I'll say it again and again, humans have never been isolated. They've always known about each other, except for Neanderthals. Uh, they've always traded, they've always interacted. So this is this genetically we know we come out of Africa, we know we come out of Africa from remains there, and now tools, material culture in early, early, early human societies are giving us these traces back to Africa and painting for us an image of the trajectory of human migration. Uh, pieces of human skull are found in Thambaling uh, in Laos, which have been dated back to 61,000 or uh, somewhere between 61,000 and 44,000 BCE. This suggests that Laos itself, now Laos, you don't know where Laos is, Laos is between Vietnam and Thailand in Southeast Asia. It's a landlocked, mountainous country. It suggests that Laos might have been part of a migration route that eventually led to Australia. As we move then finally once or finally once again to Australia, we will say it's one of the most remote places on the planet at all, and one of the most remote places where hu early humans found themselves. <sighs> In the earliest days, moving to Australia, it's really only early humans and rodents that would have gotten onto their boat, or more properly been intentionally brought onto the boat as food, that make it from the mainland of Eurasia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, onto the island of Australia. They would have had to have crossed, as you saw on the map earlier, only about 60 miles of ocean. There would have been a lot more land at the time, but still 60 miles is a, is a substantial amount of ocean to cross. To be able to cross this 60 miles of ocean, we're dealing with the people that are able to construct rafts, who have complex skills, who probably followed the coastline as much as they could, and then, in all honesty, mostly probably got blown off course and then found themselves in Australia where they had to sort of start a new civilization with other people ever so often being blown off course onto the island as well. To go back to Mungo Man, we can ask, why does the ochre around him 
matter. Ochre was, you know, Mungo Man buried, covered in this ochre, O-C-H-E-R. This is the stuff of the artistic world of the modern, or early, early, early humans. Why does it matter? Well, if he's buried with something, there's a reason. You're not just going to go to the trouble of manufacturing all this ochre paint just to throw it away next to some random dead body that you found. This indicates burial ritual. This indicates some sense of some kind of afterlife for which Mungo Man's body needed to be prepared. And that then, if we've got burial ritual, if we've got some sense of an afterlife, their friends there, we have religious belief of some kind as well. The reasons for uh, the cremation of Mungo Woman, again at the same site, are unknown. But again, it indicates, you know, commitment. Human cremation, it's hard. You got to get a fire very hard, hot. It takes a long time to burn a human body. So having Mungo Woman there as well indicates, you know, a, a kind of a multiplicity of ways of approaching caring for the dead among the earliest Homo sapiens. So let's then talk about the peopling of Europe. Now, Europe is a new and interesting problem for humans. Not to say that the coast of India is exactly like Africa, but we haven't been to a cold place yet, and Europe is a cold place. Humans, what sets them apart from other hominins is essentially their ability to reason, their ability to think through a problem that presents itself solve it, and repeat that solution. Humans, because they are smarter, are able then to adapt to all kinds of new hunting conditions, all kinds of new climactic conditions, and things like that in many different places. Humans went into Europe in one of two ways. One, they would have followed the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, or two, they would have gone up the Danube River. Large hunting parties would have been employed while humans are in Europe to prepare for the winter. So you would have done a lot of hunting, a lot of preserving of meat and making of leathers and skins and things like that to keep you warm through the winter. The earliest Homo sapiens found in Europe are the uh, are known as Cro-Magnon, C-R-O space M-A-G-N-O-N. They would have been found in southwest France, dating to about 38,000 BCE. Now these Cro-Magnon also fished, it's not just hunting animals, and it's possible to see their technology slowly develop as they move along the coastlines and rivers, changing their fishing technology depending on what kind of thing they are after. How they are fishing matters and how they are fishing changes depending on the fish. So as they move they produced bone needles for sewing, and they also produced, as you can see in the background of this video, as well as the PowerPoint slide I'm currently on, all kinds of cave artwork uh, depicting the world around them. This is perhaps one of the most famous artworks by early humans. This is, you'll have to excuse my French, Chevet, let's say, caves of France, with uh, where we have traces of charcoal that date to about 30,000 BCE, one of the earliest cave paintings found anywhere in the world. And as I was reading about this cave painting, because again, this is well outside of my wheelhouse, as I was reading about this cave painting, I was reading that in fact, the person who did this might be a little embarrassed that this is the earliest cave painting we have and that it has become so famous. Because if we look, especially on the right-hand side of this painting, you can see four horse heads. Some experts think that what this is, is a sort of pre-modern sketchbook, sort of prehistorical sketchbook. And what's happening is our artist here is sort of learning how to get horse heads correct. We're not trying to paint many horses. We're just sketching over and over again, how does one draw a horse head so we can get it right when we get to the actual cave painting. But nonetheless, it's interesting. It's a very uh, learned and considered reflection on the world that this person would stop and try to get it right and have to really reflect on and study these animals that would have been massively important to their lives. We also have found early in France, we have woman with horns. So this is a carving that was found at the Lausselle cave uh, in France. This is a block of stone 
that came from a rock shelter occupied by people between 25,000 and 21,000 BCE. Now, some analysts propose that her hand on her stomach indicates that she is pregnant. That may or may not be true. She also apparently is holding a horn. It's anybody's guess what that might mean. There were, however, as we can see from Woman with Horn, there were enormous amounts of these kinds of statues or similar statues produced by early humans around this period. There seems to have been a lot of attention paid to pregnant women in prehistorical Europe. And I think, you know, that's not really that difficult to understand. I mean, perhaps it's about fertility. Uh, there are some indications that it would have been mainly women who are not out on the hunt, mainly women who are producing these things, so they could just be very early selfies, self-portraits, this is what I think I look like, that kind of thing. It might indicate a certain form of respect or worship. It might indicate early matriarchal societies, societies run by women. It's really up for debate what exactly the meaning of these statues is, but that they exist itself is very interesting. Now, to round out part one of our discussion on the peopling of Americas, we have Neanderthals. Homo sapiens sapiens, as I said earlier, when they entered Europe 60,000 years ago, encountered a group of people who had already been there for a very long time, about 100,000 years, in fact. They encountered the Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals are so named because they're named after the site in western Germany where their remains were initially discovered. And it was thought for a long time that Neanderthals were a different species, that there was Homo Neanderthalinus. This seems, however, not to be the case. They are probably not a different species. Evidence shows that uh, they were able to mate with humans, and their DNA lives on in some but not all of us. DNA of humans in Eurasia, but not from Africa, contains 1 to 4% Neanderthal DNA. And if you look at the skeleton there, I think you can see the proof is obvious. Perhaps each of us today, as we walk around our work, our, uh, our homes, our home communities, will see you run every once in a while into somebody that kind of looks like that skeleton there. So Neanderthals live on, if only a little bit, in modern humans. And they would have met all the requirements. They made tools, they cooked food. Uh, we know Neanderthals used toothpicks. We know that they ate vegetables out of the stomachs of the animals that they killed. And we know that they decorated their homes and they decorated their graves. So we have people thinking about the afterlife, creating art or adornment in some way. Um, creating tools to solve their problems, everything that we said you had to be to be human in the most basic possible sense, Neanderthals also are. However, they're not as good at that as Homo sapiens sapiens were. Modern humans were made better tools, they were more adaptable, they eventually overtook and bred into their own population what was the Neanderthal population of Europe. And by about 40,000 years ago, Neanderthals, as a distinct group of people, died out completely, leaving only Homo sapiens in Europe. That's all I have for this time. I will see you in the next video.